All right, good afternoon. Um, next week, the Secretary General's focus will be on the environment and biodiversity and how they've been both impacted by climate change. Uh, he just landed in Lisbon in Portugal uh, a few hours ago, which is the site of the 2022 UN Ocean Conference. On Sunday, the Secretary General will address and engage with youths at the UN Ocean Conference Youth and Innovation Forum alongside the President of Portugal, Marcelo Robelo de Sousa. He will, present, uh, he will be present, present excuse me, at the conference uh, opening um, ceremony, which takes place on Monday. And there he will be joined by the uh, leaders of the two co-hosting nations, that is uh, Portugal, so he'll be joined by President Sousa again, and Kenya, the second co-hosting na nation, and President Uhuru Kenyatta will also be in attendance. The Ocean Conference aims to incentivize action to propel much-needed science-based innovation solutions aimed at starting a new chapter of global ocean action. At the conference, the Secretary General will stress that we face an, quote, ocean emergency and that we must turn to the tide. He's expected to focus on issues related to the need to invest in sustainable ocean economies for food, renewable energy, and livelihoods, and the need to protect the oceans and the people who li whose lives and livelihood depend on them from the impact and to protect them from the impact of climate change. The Secretary General is expected back to New York on the 28th of June, that is on Tuesday. Then on Friday, on July 1st, he will head off to, uh, to Paramaribo, the capital of Suriname, uh, for the 43rd meeting of the Conference of Heads of Governments of CARICOM, which you know is the Caribbean community. The Secretary General will attend the opening ceremony of the CARICOM summit, which will take place on July 3rd. As you know, the Caribbean region is among the world's hardest hit by the worsening climate impacts, despite having contributed among, other, uh, among the least to the problem due to very low emissions. In March, the IPCC designated the Caribbean region as highly climate vulnerable, meaning its people are 15 times more likely to die of climate impacts. During the conference, the Secretary General will discuss his recent announcement that the UN will work to ensure that all people on Earth are covered by early warning systems within five years, and that is up from six out of ten six in ten people now. In the face of severe climate challenges and with very scarce resources, the Caribbean region is taking vital steps to build climate resilience, which the Secretary General will observe firsthand during his stay in Suriname. He will visit an indigenous community in the rainforest to learn more about harnessing indigenous knowledge to help adapt climate impacts. He will also underscore the importance of nature-based climate solutions during a visit to a coastal mangrove site where he will witness Suriname's coastline susceptibility to flooding, which has been heightened by the sea level rise and extreme weather events resulting from the climate crisis. We expect our boss back here on July 4th. Meanwhile, the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, is, uh, continues her stay in Kigali, where she attended the official opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting hosted by the President of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. She also attended an interactive event hosted by the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Patricia Scotland. Ms. Mohammed had a meeting with President Kenyatta during which she updated him on the work of the Global Crisis Response Group and discussed efforts to advance sustainable development and durable peace in the East African region. She also had discussions with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada, who is the co-chair of the Secretary General's SDG Advocate Group. In the afternoon, uh, the Deputy Secretary General visited the Art Rwanda Ubuhansi Incubation Center, which is a UN-supported nationwide talent search project aiming at identifying and supporting the young and talented Rwandans within the creative art community. Tomorrow, she will continue her discussions with participating leaders, including President Kagame. Um, earlier this morning, the Secretary General addressed by pre-recorded video message the Ministerial Conference on Global Food Security, which is convened by, uh, G, uh, by Germany on behalf of the G7. During the, in his message, he reiterated his concerns that the war in Ukraine has compounded problems that have been brewing for years, climate, uh, climate disruption, excuse me, climate disruption, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the deeply unequal recovery. There is a real risk that multiple famines will be declared in 2022, Mr. Guterres said, 
adding that 2023 could be even worse. The humanitarian support is essential, but added that this crisis goes beyond food and requires a coordinated multilateral approach with multidimensional solutions. The Secretary General told the ministers about his efforts to get agreement to reintegrate Ukraine's food production as well as food and fertilizer produced by Russia into the world markets. He also called for action to solve the finance crisis in the developing world. Today's discussion, he concluded, are an opportunity for concrete steps to stabilize food markets and tackle the volatility of commodity prices. And also in another video message uh, that was released this morning, overnight, really, New York time, the Secretary General spoke at the launch event of his ex action agenda on internal displacement. The Secretary General said that our world is facing a crisis with record high number of people around the world displaced within their countries by tragedies such as conflict disasters and the climate crisis. Building on the recommendations of the high-level panel on internal displacement, the action agenda aims to help internally displaced persons find durable solutions to better prevent future displacement crises and to ensure stronger protection and assistance for those currently facing displacement. As you will hear a lot more on this, you'll hear a lot more on this initiative from our guest, Robert Piper, who is his special advisor on solutions to internal displacements, and he'll be my guest in a few minutes. And today is a very important day. It is the first ever day of internet, it's the first ever International Day of Women in Diplomacy. It was recently adopted by consensus by the General Assembly. The resolution was introduced by the Maldives, whose representatives said that women's participation in decision-making is an absolutely vital, and yet far too often, as women climb the diplomatic ranks, they are outnumbered by their male peers, including at UN headquarters, where they represent only one-fifth of the permanent representatives. Uh, our Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, said in a tweet that we must all do, we must do everything possible to ensure women are at their table, voices are heard, and contributions valued. Um, as today marks four months since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Amina Wad, the Assistant Secretary General, UN Crisis Coordinator in Ukraine, said that the war has now uprooted 12 million Ukrainians. They, are, they need a durable solution to end their displacement. This requires a concerted efforts by all. The UN has expanded its presence in the country, working closely with the Ukrainian government, as well as over 300 local civil society partners and international non-governmental organizations, scaling up assistance at unprecedented speed. We are now reaching almost 9 million people with essential support. In eastern Ukraine, heavy fighting continues with civilians trapped and cut off from food, drinking water, and electricity. We continue to call for humanitarian access to these areas to reach civilians requiring urgent assistance. Humanitarian partners are already working on assistance plan to support the Ukrainian people during the forthcoming winter. However, the urgent energy needs to go need, needs go beyond the capacity of humanitarians requiring concerted efforts by states to support Ukraine. And turning to Ethiopia, I can tell you that we are concerned by the situation in Western Ethiopia where conflicts in Oromia, uh, Benishangul Gumuz, and SNNP regions have caused significant displacement, damaged infrastructure, and hampered uh, humanitarian response. Overall, more than 500,000 people are estimated to be displaced by conflicts in Western Oromia. The severe drought is affecting more than 8 million people in Ethiopia, including in some areas affected by the conflict in Southern Oromia and Afar regions. Over 4.5 million men, women, and children have received assistance in drought-impacted areas. Across Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia, at least 18.4 million people are already waking each day to high levels of acute food insecurity and rising malnutrition as the region faces the impact of four consecutive failed rainy seasons, a climactic event not seen in the last 40 years. Humanitarian partners urgently need additional funding to respond to the rapidly increasing needs in the coming months. Across Tigray, Amhara, and Afar regions in the north, some 13 million people now need food and other assistance. Since the convoys to Tigray resumed in the start of April, we and our NGO partners have brought in more than 120,000 tons of food and other supplies, and more than 1.3 million people have received food assistance. 
However, the pace of distribution remains limited by the availability of fuel. Some 987,000 liters of fuel have been brought into Tigray during this period, but an estimated 2 million liters per month is required to fully distribute the incoming supplies. Quick note from Central African Republic, where our peacekeeping mission reports that they are supported the deployment of a mobile Central African team in charge of national disarmament, demobilization, rehabilitation, and reintegration uh, in the southeast of the country from the 13th to the 22nd of June. They conducted operations in the Otembo Prefecture, which resulted in the disarmament and demobilization of 51 combatants, as well as a collection of weapons and ammunition. In the process, five children were identified, separated from armed groups, and referred to a local child protection uh, organization to be reintegrated with their families. And from Mali, I can tell you that uh, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths, today allocated four million U.S. dollars from the Central Emergency Response Fund to respond to the displacement crises in Meneka in Mali. Uh, in March 22nd, armed clashes in the Meneka region killed hundreds of people and triggered displacement of an estimated 56,000 people, nearly two-thirds of them women and children. More than 61 percent of the displaced people have not received any form of shelter, non-food relief items, and water and sanitation assistance. Only half of the displaced communities were been supported with food or cash. Displaced people and host populations need food assistance, shelter, non-food assistance, and better protection for women and girls. Today, a total of 7.5 million people in Mali need humanitarian assistance. 1.8 million people will be acutely food insecure this year because of insecurity and climate change. As of now, only 11 percent of the humanitarian requirements of $685.7 million have been received, only 11 percent. This year, Surf Secretariat already allocated $18 million to Mali to help scale up the response. The latest contribution brings the total funding to almost $100 million channeled through SURF to the Sahel response since the beginning of the year. Um, and, uh, sorry, thank you. And a quick note from Micronesia, where the UN team there is led by the resident coordinator, Yap van Hirden as the team continues to support the governments of Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of Marshall Islands, Nauru and Kiribati in responding to the pandemic. WHO will continue working with the government of Nauru to identify the areas where support is needed and has been dialing, uh, dealing with its first community transmission after two and a half years of being COVID free. WHO worked in tandem with the government to build capacity through training sessions at community health centers. The focus is to enable health professionals to test and treat mild symptoms of COVID-19 through available therapeutics while keeping major hospitals from getting overwhelmed. In Palau, the UN has worked closely with U.S. Centers for Disease Control and the government to attain one of the highest vaccination um, coverage rates in the world, almost 100 percent, prior to its first surge of COVID-19 community transmissions in early 2022. This vaccination rate contributed to the effective management of COVID-19 outbreak in Palau and low critical cases. Meanwhile, to ensure that teaching and learning was not interrupted during the extensive lockdown, UNICEF partnered with Microsoft to support the authorities in Kiribati to develop a learning passport, uh, which has benefited some 9,000 students in Kiribati. Madam. As we all know, the United Nations always defended um, rights to abortion for all women around the world. Today, U.S. Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade. Um, is this action a violation of human rights, and what steps can the United Nations take on this matter? And did um, Secretary General had any comment about this today? Okay. What, what I can, you know, we've we've seen and we've taken note of the decision by the Supreme Court uh, today. What I can do is reiterate what has been our principal position on this issue. And one is that sexual and reproductive health and rights are the foundation of a life of choice, empowerment, and equality for the world's women and girls. 
I think it's also important to note that you know, restricting access to abortion does not prevent people from seeking abortion. It only makes it more deadly. That's according to our, our data. Uh, you know, UNFPA tells us that some 45% of all abortions around the world are unsafe, making it a leading cause of maternal health. I think clearly the ability of women uh, to control what happens to their own bodies is linked to the status and roles they play in society more broadly whether as members of family, in the workforce, or in uh, government. Uh, I think what we've said a number of times is that reproductive rights are integral to women's rights, to human rights more generally, a principle upheld by international agreement and reflected in law to varying degrees in many parts of the world. Gabriel. Thank you. Um, the New York Times. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Associated Press, CNN, they've all held independent, they've all conducted independent investigations into the uh, killing of journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. Now we can add the United Nations to that list. As you know, the UN Human Rights Office uh, conducted an extensive independent investigation into her killing and concluded uh, that uh, the bullets that killed her uh, came from um, Israeli security forces. And the agency said they were, quote, unquote, disturbed that Israel has yet to conduct any criminal investigation. My question is, is the Secretary General also disturbed? If so, what does he have planned to do about it, given that he's already expressed that he wants Israel to investigate? I mean, we fully back uh, you know, the, the review and the monitoring that our human rights colleagues announced today uh, in the killing of your, of your, of your colleague. Um, it is important that there be accountability. It is important that there is a real criminal investigation uh, so that we can get accountability, and that continues to be our call. Edward, and just then follow up. On, okay, uh, so go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Just, uh, the High Commissioner uh, Michel uh, Michel Bachelet specifically urged is Israel to open the criminal criminal investigation on this uh, issue. Do you support her call? I mean, we, that specifically Israel we, we, should we, open we, the we support, investigation. Uh, we support the statements made today by our human rights colleagues. Uh, hi, Steph. Uh, during the break. BRICS summit, uh, the Chinese President Xi said, and I quote, uh, the global community should stay true to the pledge of the UN Charter and fulfill the mission of maintaining peace. I just want to know any reactions from the Secretary General on this and what, what because it's only two days away from the UN Charter Day, any, and any, any statement would come well, from I mean, the Secretary we, General on this? I mean, I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, that we call on all 193 member states uh, to continuously uphold the principles of the Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And another follow-up with uh, the uh, Akhle uh, issue. Since, since you said uh, there should be first a criminal investigation on this by Israeli uh, government, if they do not have this uh, criminal investigation, how to hold the criminal accountable? Is there any other way? Are there any well, other I mean, ways? The only way to hold anyone accountable is for an investigation to take, uh, to take place. I mean, and I think it's important that all the parties involved conduct an investigation. But if, if, Israel, if Israel said they, they don't want to do this, then well, I, I mean, I, I'm just, do that. you know, I, I think some, some of these questions are, are for you to ask others. I mean, I'm just telling you what our, our position is. Yes, sir. National News Agency of Ukraine, Vodemir Chenko. I now we hear from world politicians that Russia purposefully weaponizes the food crisis, creating a grain famine by blockading Ukrainian ports and stealing grain from Ukraine. It is reported that half a million tons of grain have usually uh, have already been stolen in the occupied territories. What arguments 
do UN negotiators use to convince Moscow to be humane, to stop causing artificial famine in many countries of the world? Well, I, I mean, what we are doing is doing whatever we can uh, to, so that there is an agreement to reintegrate uh, the huge amount of grain produced by Ukraine and by Russia onto world market. That's what we're trying to do. Yes, Ephraim. Thank you. Just a quick question. Uh, the 13 million Ethiopians who are in need of assistance, how many of them uh, has the UN been able to reach? Let me get you a breakdown from our OCHA colleagues. Uh, great. I will get our... Uh, I will get our guest, and then we will have Paulina. 